good worship. Very, uh, very intimate. An opportunity to connect with God before we connect with Him in the Word tonight. I had a really cool experience, and this isn't in my talk, but it happened, so I'm going to tell you anyway, okay, because I'm up here and I get to do that stuff. All right. Uh, last night, uh, one of uh, the pastors of a small, uh, predominantly African-American church, well, a few months ago, he had a wonderful idea about getting all the pastors in the whole city together uh, and all the churches to pray about next Easter Saturday, in our case, Easter Sunday, and to worship and to pray. And frankly, I was bushed, and I really didn't want to go. But I went, and I am so glad. It was a night of unity. It was a night of love. It was a night of connection. And it was a night that reminded me that what we do here, what we do out there, matters. It matters a lot. It also reminded me that we are one church. Those of us that believe that Jesus Christ is the risen Son of God, that only through faith, through Jesus Christ, can a person be saved. Those of us that believe that, the majors, we're one church. And we ought to support each other. You know what I'm saying? Because we work for the same company. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was amazing. Well, we're going to continue in our series, Hope Potion, tonight. And here's the good news. Tonight was going to be the last night. That's not the good news. After Easter, we're going to do two more messages because this series is so good, and there are two messages that just have to be given. All right? Hey, okay, I got a question for you. Have you uh, ever said, hope it works? You know, many of us know that moment of truth, right? We build something or we just fix something, put it back together. And right before you, you pull the string or you flip the switch or you turn the key, you say, I hope it works. I hope it works. How about uh, a friend or a relative is going to get married? And you know there are some big red flags. I hope it works. Well, that's not exactly what we're going to talk about tonight, but it's kind of what we're going to talk about. Let me explain. Most of us work. Some of us are looking for work, and almost everyone here has worked at some time. Many of us don't realize that the moment that we're in, we're actually in a career. It may be a career for a season. It may not feel like a career, but it's your career for right now. Or it may be a career for a lifetime. Uh, if you just work 40 hours, and I said just because lots of people work more than 40 hours, but if you work a regular 40-hour week, which is considered full-time, if you include your lunch hours, about 40% of your waking time is at work. Work is not just a place to earn money. Many of us, we just don't realize that we're somewhere that God has for us, you know, on purpose. Now, if you work 55 hours a week, and there are some of us here that do, well over 50% of your awake time is spent at work. Work isn't just where you make a living. Work is actually God's plan for your life. Sorry to rain on your parade, but unless you're retired, work is God's plan for your life. So, what is work about? Well, yeah, it's a place to make a living but it's also a place where our character is revealed. It's a place where our life is shaped. And too often, it's a place where we don't have any hope. Would you like to be able to not just get hope or maintain hope, but actually grow hope, grow your hope at work? Not a trick question, you guys. Yeah? All right, okay. All right, I know this egg's lost, but I need you to, I need you to re-engage. Get your heart back up. This is good news. All right. Well, that's what we're going to talk tonight, because when it comes to work, hope, it works. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, God. I thank you, God, for every job I've ever had. I know I didn't thank you for most of them, at least for many of them, and sometimes I didn't see what you were doing, especially before I knew you, but even after I did, sometimes I just didn't get it. Lord, I thank you, Father, that, Lord, you work out great things in our work if we let you. Tonight, I pray at, at the end of this service that men and women that are currently employed, 
and men and women that are looking for work are going to walk out of here encouraged to live out hope, to bring hope, to experience hope where they work. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. You know, if you were here last week, I, 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 I asked that you would get ready, get your pen ready, because it's going to come fast and furious. Fast and Furious 2 with Paul Walker, still alive. Okay? We're doing it. All right? So number one in your outline. Character works. Character works. And if you don't know how to spell character, I always have trouble with spell check. It's right there. That is the proper, I always try to put an O there. Character works. Let me start off with a confession. My Wednesday, last Wednesday, was one of the tougher days I've had at work in a while. That morning, I sent out a text to one of my teams apologizing for not bringing much hope lately. The truth is, I realized the day before that my stress cup was full, and it had been for a while. I really tried to manage it that Wednesday morning. I got up early. I got in the Word. I prayed. I, I knew I was tense. I knew I was fired up. As I headed off to work, you know, I had the pretty high hopes, but I got hit sideways by something, and oh boy, I lost my temper. So I had to apologize for how I showed up in that situation. You know what happens sometimes? We get worked or we get worked up at work. But here's some great news. If you bring consistent good effort to your work, are consistently caring, and exhibit a pattern of good character in your work, when you blow it, like I did, if you will own it and apologize, there's a really good chance People will graciously forgive you. Not only that, it can actually turn out for the better. Here's what the scripture says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. It says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. Guilty? Yeah, I did it. I did it. But what this scripture tells me is that I can apologize to God and to the person or persons that I've wronged by my behavior and then move forward. By the way, an apology is admitting what you did wrong and saying you're sorry. Here's what an apology is not. A time for a bunch of excuses. Have you ever heard or given this apology? I'm really sorry, but you made me. And then come the rest of the excuses, right? Well, you see, when, when, when people, whether it's us or somebody else, offer a bunch of excuses along with an apology, not only does it cheapen the sincerity of the apology, if that's how they show up regularly, it doesn't help them move forward. Excuses do not help us get better. My experience of people that I've worked with and done life with that always have an excuse is they don't learn or grow very much, if at all. They just have excuses. If uh, you and I want hope to be part of our work, to be able to say hope, it works, it works. Even when we make a mistake, even when something fails, and when, like I did this week, you blow it. God has an awesome promise. Romans 8.28 says this, And we know that God causes everything to work for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purposes for them. So if we practically love God, and what I mean is we do it in practical manners, because lots of people say they love God, but practically speaking, show me, man. Show me, homie, right? right? So but if we practically love God, and are working towards His purpose in our life, no matter what happens, you can be sure that it's going to work out in the end. Now, that last part of the Scripture talks about loving God and God's purpose for our lives. Now, since work is a big part of our life, this promise must cover our career as well. A part of your and my purpose is loving God, and another part is loving people. Jesus put it pretty simply. He said, love God with all you got and love people. And He said, the the the, the, the the bottom standard for Jesus was put people even with you. But if you read the scriptures, if you listen to what Jesus says, he constantly says, put people ahead of yourself. If you want to be the greatest, put people ahead of yourself. But if you or I typically show up in our careers as rude or lazy, if we're selfish or unreliable, if we're dishonest or we're arrogant, if we don't do the best we can, not just for ourselves, but for our co-workers, our customers, our clients, whoever at work. We are missing our purpose of loving people, the people that we work with and the people we work for. 
If we show up like that in 40% of our waking hours, 40% of the waking hours, hours of our life. Wow. Houston, we have a problem. If we are missing our purpose, don't count on the promise because it's conditional. You know, I've said this before. God's love is unconditional, but many of his promises have conditions. God calls you and me to a purpose. And if our attitude, if our decisions, if our actions, if they are contrary to that purpose, it's probably not going to work out for the good at work. Hope it works, but don't hold your breath. I have some amazing friends that live their faith, their relationship with Jesus, their purpose out at work. And I'm going to tell you how influential those people are, not just with me, but with hundreds and hundreds of people. Now, on the other hand, I've experienced many, way too many Christians, people that seem like solid followers of Jesus, fail to exhibit, exhibit any consistent effort or integrity or real care for the well-being of the organization they work for or for the people they work with to serve. I wouldn't want to count or dwell on the thefts, the lies, the shoddy work, the selfishness, the double standard of my fellow Christians that I've experienced at work. Look, everyone blows it. I do, you will. Well, maybe you won't. Maybe you're perfect. But the rest of us, we're going to blow it. A bad hair day at work happens. But if what, but what I'm talking about actually is a consistent behavior. It's a pattern. That is, it's unacceptable by any standard, let alone the standard that we who God has graciously saved and loved should have. That's just not acceptable. And it doesn't have to be the case at all. When our careers begin to line up with God's promise, when we start showing up at work in ways that honor God and bless people, look out because good stuff's coming your way. Let me explain. Better yet, let, let, let the Bible explain, all right? Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. All right, so don't pretend. Be real. You know, most of us like to think that we can tell when somebody's a fake. But I get faked out more than I would like to admit. I do, man. Shoot. <laughs> Glad I'm written here because I get faked out. But here's a way that you're not on the wrong side of that. Sometimes we're going to get faked out, but don't be the faker. Be real. Just be real with people. And, and, and by the way, don't be sneaky. You know, when we're real, it means we're not sneaky. It means we're not trying to get away with stuff. If you or I feel that to promote what we want, we have to lie, cheat, or steal to be sneaky, that's a red flag. Just don't do it. All right? Here's what else it says. It says, uh, hate what is wrong. Oh, gosh. Pastor Mike, are you saying it's okay to be a hater? of what is wrong, but some people are haters of what is wrong in everybody but themselves. They hate this about that guy, and they hate this about that girl, and they hate this, and they hate that, and they hate that. You, you almost think they're going to injure themselves pointing that finger so hard, you know what I'm saying? I'm going to tell you some things that I hate, that I sincerely hate. I hate my temper. I hate it. I hate my selfishness. It wells up too often. And I hate when I get stressed out, I get controlling. But I'm honest with God, and I'm honest with the people around me. And my experience is, even though they're still there, they're less than they used to be. Hate what is evil. Hate what is wicked in you. Don't hate yourself. Don't hate yourself. God loves you. But hate what is evil and wicked in you. And watch God change you. As a matter of fact, if you'll do that, you'll actually feel a lot better about yourself. Be genuine. Love and honor each other. Build people up. Bring energy and enthusiasm to what you're doing. Help people. Assist them. Good grief. Sometimes just smile. Like if some of you were smiling back at me right now, I'd be feeling a lot better about this message. <laughs> I would. <laughs> yeah. I asked a dear friend of mine the other day. I said, hey, buddy, are you, are you happy? Are you okay? And he goes, yeah. Yeah. And I go, well, tell your face, man. <laughs> you know, some of you are, are, are serious-minded people. But you know what? I'm a joker at heart, and sometimes i got to be serious. So if i got to be serious, you all need to smile sometimes, okay? Can we work that out a little bit? Smile. 
And uh, don't be lazy. Don't procrastinate. Once someone gets into the habit of putting off what is best done today or cutting corners, and I've managed people for almost a quarter century, it's almost impossible for them to get that turned around. Instead, make and create good habits. If you're not sure what that looks like, find successful people. Ask them what they do. Ask them what they look for in people that they, that they see promising. Ask your employer or your employee or your customer how you're doing. And then take the feedback to heart. Sometimes I asked and I didn't like what I heard. But if that is a reasonable person, that feedback is priceless. Don't ask your negative slacker ne'er-do-wells, and we've all got friends like that, right? Don't ask them. They usually have strong opinions about a lot of things. They're strong and wrong, and especially about work, all right? It's pretty simple, really. Don't be lazy. Work hard. Be kind and honest. Pastor Mike, you're chilling me. <laughs> no, not really. I'm not. Telling you the secret to being a great CEO and a great homemaker. And both of those jobs are equally important. I'm telling you how to be great in the career that God has for you at this moment. How much hope is generated by being really, really, really good at the important work that God has given you right now? The amazing career God has for you in this season of life. I want to talk about four of my friends that I admire greatly. Hannah. Holly, Dawn, I love you. Where's where's my where's my where's my hairstylist? Where's Kimmy? Kimmy, raise your hand. Okay, and Kim. All right, I want to brag on these women. Uh, they have incredibly alive and hopeful homes. They have sacrificed greatly, as their husbands have, so that they can stay home in this season of life and raise their kids. They're creative. They find ways to make extra money and save it. But they put their life, their best, in raising their children and taking care of their part as their husbands sacrifice to take care of their part. Now, can I tell you something else? They could do anything. They're totally capable of anything they choose to do. They choose to do this right now. And it shows. They have hope. They have hope in their work, in their career. And you can tell the minute you walk into their house. Now, does it get hard? Does it ever get tight? I'm sure it does. It did for Lisa and I when we chose uh, for her to stay at home with our kids, but it was so worth it. I, come, I used to work 12, 14 hours a day to make that work. But, you know, I came home to a clean home and something to eat, and usually it was pretty good every night. It wasn't like we didn't have a real house. We had our kids, and we had the whole neighborhood there. But Lisa made it a great place. And I am so grateful for that season in her life. It made a difference. My three daughters are incredible, incredible young women. And I think that sacrifice is a big part of it. Whatever you get to do right now, bring energy and commitment. Here's what the Bible says. It says, Do you see any truly competent workers? They'll serve kings rather than working for ordinary people. Do you see... Hold on. Stop. I got carried away. Just look at that for a second. All right. The Amplified Version says this. Do you see a person diligent and skillful in their business? They'll stand before kings. They will not stand before obscure men. Now, the reason I had both of these versions is because competent is not well understood in our culture today. Oftentimes, we think it's competent. It's okay. It's all right. It's acceptable. Competent does not mean that at all. Competent means that in all phases of what someone does, there is soundness, there is integrity. It is structurally, morally, relationally sound. You can count on it. All right, number two, passion works. Passion works. Uh, this is passionate work, okay? It works in other places too, but we're talking about work. You know what drives me? It drives me crazy when I talk to a fellow Christian and they say, ah, it's just a job. I'm just doing it till something better comes along. 
It's all I can do to not go into the Pastor Mike 10-minute speech about you should work hard under the Lord and give him your very best. Most of the time, I do not give the speech. <laughs> Sometimes I do. Listen, if you don't grow in the container that God's planted you, why on earth would he put you in a bigger container? Well, truth is, he's not. Do you have passion? <laughs> Let me tell you, right now our pastor's team is working very hard on systemizing what we do at City Church. Systemizing everything we can systemize. Boring, right? No, not at all. When I think of the servants that serve here every week, not just for Sunday, but throughout the week, when I think of the team leads, that most of them, they're not on staff. They're serving God. When I think of them and how hard they work, and I realize that systems make people better, that, that they make us more successful. And when we're successful, that brings hope. When we systemize everything that we can, you know what it means? It means there's actually more room for the Holy Spirit and relationships to flourish because we don't waste time and energy trying to figure out the same thing over and over and over. And we don't frustrate our people. Am I passionate about systems? Uh, well, I am passionate about people. How about you? Maybe you're doing something right now that doesn't seem like much to get excited about. Unleash your passion. Ask God what could be. Find the ignition switch. Pastor Mike, I'm a cry cook. All right, let's start there. Pray for your team. Love your team. Love that kitchen team. Bring your best. Can, can, can you make that system and that kitchen a little bit better? Look at it what it could be. Because I guarantee if you show up like that, whatever you're doing, you won't be doing that for very long. You'll be running that kitchen. You'll be running that restaurant. Maybe you'll have a string of restaurants of your own. Three and a half years ago, I had the pleasure of meeting Joe Rocha. He is the mayor of Azusa, California. And by the way, Joe is in this book. And what it says in this book is exactly what we experienced with Joe. My youngest was a was a freshman, an incoming freshman at Azusa. And like thousands of other parents, we were nervous about leaving our baby girl at college, 1,357 miles away. And the president gave a wonderful, the president of the college gave a wonderful talk, and I remember some things, but I'll never forget Joe. He's a, he's a, uh, a solidly built, older Hispanic man, reminds me of my stepdad, the man that raised me. So I already kind of was in his favor. But uh, he gets up and he says, hi, I'm Joe Rocha. I'm the mayor of Azusa, California. And I want you to know, you're... I said I wasn't going to get choked up. This was so cool. He said, you're in my town now. And if you ever have a problem, you're my family. And then you know what he did? He put his phone number up there for everybody. 2,000, 3,000 students, all their crazy parents. And he said, if you have a problem anytime, Day or night, you call me. Yeah, right? Joe didn't get that way when he got the job as mayor. He got the job as mayor because he is that way. You be like that and just see where God will take you. Now, being passionate is really great when it comes to work, if it's for the right things. When someone sincerely wants their work to be great, when they want the best for their organization, when they are willing to give their best for the best results for as many people as possible. That's when truly special things begin to happen at work. Being passionate is a wonderful thing. Oh, a word the Bible uses for great passion for something is zealous. And in Galatians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18, it says this. I see Apostle Paul talking to some folks, and he says, those people are zealous to win you over, but for no good. They want it, they want what they want is to alienate you from us so that you may have zeal for them. It's fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good, and to be so always, not just when I am with you. Now, while the scripture is in regard to some people bringing false teaching into the church, it does show an awesome truth. God wants us to be passionate about the right stuff, to be passionate about doing good, whether people see, or they don't see, where they notice, or they don't notice. Be passionate about helping other people succeed, and you will be surprised how successful you will be. 
The Bible says the crop we plant is the crop we harvest. In the short run, a few people are going to take advantage of that. In the long run, if we don't quit and we don't get better, bitter about those few people who missed our hearts, we will ultimately be hopeful and successful. Be passionate for the right stuff. All right, number three, healing works. Healing works. Don't be a jerk at work. I rhyme, so you should be able to remember that one, right? All right, you know who I'm talking about. It's that guy or that gal. They're passionate, but they're always passionate about what they want for their own benefit. That gets tiresome, doesn't it? And that often comes from a, a selfish heart, and it causes divisions. It's divisive. So don't be that person. There's a better way. Look, grown-ups need to realize that there is going to be relational problems sometimes. That's just part of the deal. Passionate people can get carried away from time to time. Oh, boy, do I know that. I'm passionate. There is a difference between being passionate and being a uniter and passionate and being a divider. Remember former President Bush? Be a uniter, not a divider. Yeah. Well, I like the thought. It's a great thought. When it gets hot and heavy on the teams that I work with, and it does, when people are passionate about something, hurtful things can and are said. Sometimes it's not intentional. Sometimes someone doesn't even know they did it. I've caused hurts. Others have caused them. It might be the way someone perceives something. Often people get hurt because they have an issue. And what's said hits close to home. It might be pride and arrogance. The need to be right leads to a lot of wrong. It can be what was said was simply unwise and hurtful. That kind of stuff comes out of my mouth from time to time, sorry to say. Maybe in a passionate moment, we just simply feel shut down. We sometimes get our feelings hurt because we missed something. We fail in our mission. It happens, and then we get called on. Last week, we heard what a great leader John Wooden said. He said, if someone doesn't fail at something, they aren't doing anything. Failure happens. You know, recently a good friend uh, told me, a day or two later, he said, well, you were right. I had called him on something where he had missed it. He said, you were right, but I didn't want to face it. So I couldn't be mad at me, so I was mad at you. It was easier for a while. But did I mention this person as a good friend? Here's one of the reasons I love this guy so much and respect him. He then said, when I realized my mistake, I couldn't be mad at you anymore. That person is going places because his nature is to heal. Healing works. When we are wrong, admit it. When others have wronged us, give them enough room to own it and apologize. Now, one of the things that grown-ups realize is that everyone won't get it. Some people, unfortunately, are toxic. They may be gifted. They may be our friends. They may have had some big successes in the organization. But if they are, as Ray Johnston, the author of Hope Quotient, says, always leaving broken glass around them, it's not worth it. And you, you and I, let's be healers. Let's be healers. Let's be peacemakers at work, not glass breakers. All right, number four, adding value works. Adding value works. Mm. Have you ever heard the phrase, under promise and over deliver? How many of you guys have ever heard that phrase? Yeah, if you're in sales, you've heard it, right? All right, that philosophy has given me a good living and a good life. This week, as our management team, see, I'm, I'm the lead pastor here, but I'm employed. Uh, I make a living uh, at the company that my wife and I founded. We're not the day-to-day -day leaders anymore, but uh, I'm still involved there. And this week, our, our management team was meeting, and a couple of our company leaders were given the task at looking at our prices in two of our most complex services. In most of the services that we do, a single pricing structure works well for our company and our customer. But in two of them, we realize that we have to do some hard thinking to make sure we're competitive and we don't overcharge. In that meeting, I was so glad to see that our first concern was overcharging. Add value. I'm passionate. 
There's no getting around it. There's that word again. But I'm passionate about adding value. I know sometimes people don't see that as a benefit with me. Because when I get a few minutes with someone, I want to see them grow. I want to see them reach their potential. I want to see them not make the same dumb mistakes I once did. So I give them my best. I used to say that free advice is worth what it costs. But here's the truth. I paid some very high prices to get where I am. Why would I not want to add value to your life? I lead younger leaders, and they are usually pretty bright. They do not, however, usually know as much as they seem to think they do. That's not always the case, but usually it is. Now listen, I should ask more questions. Sometimes I should take a breath. I should stop talking when I see their eyes glaze over. I know that. But I also should let everyone in this room know that I was once a young person with great promise. And I didn't always appreciate what the older people in my life said. But how many times would I later in my 30s and in my 40s and now in my late 50s think back and access the wisdom, the value that they added to my life? It's important. So if you're older, don't stop investing in the next generation. And if you're the next generation, yeah, you're smart, you're sharp, and you'll have to show me how to use my phone again and again. But there are some things that 56 years walking this planet has taught me. 25 years of walking with Jesus has taught me that you don't know yet. The Bible says, freely you have received, freely give. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8, our Lord says this. He says, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you've received and freely give. Sick, dead, leprosy, demons. At first I thought this scripture didn't fit, and then I thought about some of the places I've worked. It fits perfectly. <laughs> yeah. So what that should tell you is instead of trying to get out of tough work situation that you're in right now, get to giving. Add value. The Bible says there's one who is stingy and they have nothing, and there's one who gives freely and they have much. It takes faith and patience to add value in any situation, especially when it's a tough situation. It also takes faith and patience to plant a great crop, a crop that will have huge harvest, but it's worth it. Add value. So I want to finish tonight with a few questions. All right? The first question. What's unique about me? Not me, you. All right? What's unique about you? But when you're talking about you, then it's me. You get that, right? We're all, you know, it's tricky. The Bible says to uh, train up a child in the way they should go. But here's the deal. That has such a broad meaning as the kind of person God wants them to be and the person that God has made them to be. One is general. The Scripture and the Holy Spirit reveal the way kids need to live to honor God and be decent human beings. But the other is specific. How's that kid wired? Now, God does not give us parenting advice that he doesn't keep himself. He parents us the same way. The Amplified Bible nails this verse and the principle behind it. It says, train up a child in the way he should go and in keeping with his individual gift or bent and when he is old, he will not depart from it. You have some natural gifts. Those should be cultivated. They should be developed, made the most of. By the way, that's work. It's not easy. If you'll make that effort, eventually you can use them more and more in your career. Maybe your mom and dad gave you a great start. Awesome. <laughs> Maybe like my parents, they didn't. No matter. We've all got some work to do. Sometimes we just got to stop and tell that inner child, get cracking. Tell her if she doesn't, if she doesn't threaten her, just say, I'm going to tell your inner child, I'm going to go in there. Do I have to come in there with you? Yeah. Don't have that conversation out loud, though, because that's not going to be perceived well. The sad truth is, though, that many people have gifts that they do very little with or nothing. They may dream. They may procrastinate. And often they complain, but they're not developing their unique gifts. Don't do that. 
Find what you're good at and get better at it. Give it a chance to shine if you do. By the way, if you're not a kid, I'm not a kid. I believe this applies to me and the rest of us olders out there. All right? So if you're not a kid, don't check out on me, all right? If you're still breathing, you got life. And if you got life, you got hope, okay? All right. The second question, what fulfills me? What fulfills me? You know, earlier I mentioned four homemakers. Let me ask you something. Is a house builder or better than a homemaker? Is an empire builder than a homemaker? Don't get me started. No. <laughs> when uh, those four women look back on their lives and what they've accomplished, I believe they will be tremendously fulfilled. It's just a hunch, but I'm pretty sure I'm right. What good thing fulfills you? Is it closing a fair and equitable sale that benefits both reasonable parties? Is it leading a management team to success with ethics and the credit is shared around, all around by that team? Uh, caring for the sick and being more than just a healthcare worker. You're a healer. You're a bringer of hope. Working hard at something that you don't particularly like at this moment, but doing your very best to bring hope at work and provide for your family. Simply knowing that what you're doing, what is needed for your peeps right now, that's what's needed. Fulfillment is important, and it's not always the same as the next question. What makes me happy? You know what makes me happy? You want to know? I don't care if you do or not. I'm up here. I'm going to tell you. I'm really happy after a good surf session, especially on a sunny day. I'm happy. But you know, sometimes I look around uh, at the surf break that uh, is kind of my favorite spot in San Clemente, California, and I see old guys, well, guys my age, guys who by now, because they chose to live uh, where they live, that have surfed hundreds, heck, thousands of times more than me, who have caught great swells that I didn't even know about. But because I chose to live, to love, to work, and to serve here in Spokane, I might have missed that. I might have missed that. But I got a great family. I got a great marriage. I've been blessed beyond anything I could imagine in my career. And I get to do this. I get to love this church. I get to love you. Your lives matter. I'm part of that. It doesn't always make me happy, but it really fulfills me. But here's the truth. If you, if you would choose to seek first what fulfills you, what you're made to do, and develop that, eventually you'll get to the happy part. But if you chase what's your, what makes you happy all the time, you might be happy for a while, but those around you aren't going to be. Those that count on you won't be. And God isn't either. I had a friend ask me some years ago when he was struggling with a hard decision. God wants me happy, right? And I stopped for a second and I said, uh, he was really struggling. It was a tough time. I didn't want to tip him over. So I said, uh, no. <laughs> God cares more about your character than he does your happiness. But if you'll if you'll lean into God, you'll get happy. It'll come. It'll come. You see, I wouldn't trade my life today for any of those guys on that beach. Years ago, I tried to talk my wife into moving back here. Or back to Southern California. And she stamped her little foot down. My wife is good and she's kind and she lets me lead, but there's times, <laughs> there's times wisdom prevails when my leadership is getting stupid. And she said, there is no way I'm going to raise my children in Southern California now. If you've done that, I'm not going to, I'm not saying anything. There are great families there, but she was serious. And I am so happy that I did the right thing and fulfilled. And that leads me to the last thing. What's best for my family? What's best for my family? 
as I get on hooks. Yeah. I wrestled with this. Because I know right now by the tenor in this room that this is a challenging message. Some of you don't like what you've heard. Some of you feel like maybe, you know, that train's left the station. And if, if that's the case, I'm sorry for you. There's life left, but maybe some of the things I talked about, yeah, that's true. You missed it. But the vast majority of you, that's not the case. All right? So when we ask this question, can you, can you put that back up for me, please? What's best for my family? I want you to think real hard on this. I'm going to talk to the guys first. Uh, here's what the Bible says. It says some cool stuff. It says number one on things. Okay. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives and especially for their own household has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's the NIV. Let's look at what the NLT says. But those who won't care for their relatives, especially those in their own household, have denied the true faith. Such people are worse than unbelievers. Now let's look at a better translation, the ESV. But if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. I'm not a chauvinist. I'm married to a strong leader. I've raised three, three young women that I believe are very strong women. But when we get gender neutral at the wrong time, we miss the heart of God and the calling of God. Men, your job, first and foremost, in your family are three Ps. Provider, protector, and priest. If you want to be a priest and you don't get those other two right, you might want to put your priest stuff in the, in the, in, in the drawer for a while. God calls us to provide for our families. We may be in a tough situation right now, but our job is to do everything that we can to provide for our families. All right? That's he, and there's a reason for that. God made us for that. And when we fail to do that, not only, we're not getting away with anything. It, you, do you know people that are failing in that area, and do you see them as hopeful people? Do you see them as positive people? Do you see them as even happy people? No. Guys, God's called us to that. You might say, Pastor Mike, I don't make as much as my wife. I get it. When we got married, I didn't make anything close to, to Lisa. But God gave me the ability to develop my talents and to work hard, and eventually I had a great career. Do you think God's just picking favorites on me? No, fellas, God can do anything. You just get your heart lined up with what the Word of God says. Because while women can be very good at what they do and can have fantastic careers, He doesn't give them that, that command. He gives it to us. Now, they can do that. But we have to do that. That's not a choice. It's a command, all right? So if I'm being too strong, good. All right? Wow, you bet. You bet. I was raised by a single mom who did everything because my dad split. That ain't much of a man. All right? Okay. Now here's the next thing. Is it time? Am I done? Are we Okay. Should we go downstairs to the bomb shelter now? <laughs> okay. I was. I looked at my clock, but my, my, yeah, my phone don't make that noise, so I'm off the hook. <laughs> I'm not judging you. I'm just willing to leave. Okay. So anyway, when we ask what's best for our family, you've got to be careful here. Because sometimes somebody, you know what, they're going to ask what's best for their family, and they're thinking this isn't cool, and they're going to go home and quit their job. Don't do that. Don't do that tonight, all right? There's three, you can quit your job if you do these three things. If you're a terrorist, stop your job today. It's not God's will for you. It's not best for your family. If you're a drug lord, are you tithing? Because I'm not seeing the checks. <laughs> stop that. You're done, all right? All right? And uh, if you're a hit man or hit woman for the mob, those three, go, go ahead tonight. You can stop. But everything else, be deliberative, be prayerful, and be wise. What's good for my family? Here's some things that have helped me make good decisions on what's good for my family. This is a good book. This is a good book, but this is a great book. And if you let the Word of God frame your thinking, you will make better choices than you made the year before, the decade before. In my case, people think I'm smart. It's the Word of God. It's simply the Word of God. Wise counsel. Get 
wise counsel. A few weeks ago, I told you the story. When I went to my friend, Mike Abella, I was a young guy. I was 32 years old. I didn't know what to do. I was working full time and I was starting a company and I was tired. And I asked myself, am I doing the right thing for my family? And Mike said to me, Mike, Mike's are smart. He said, Mike, he said, sometimes you have to do hard things for a season for your family. And I am so grateful that I listen. Get wise advice. And get on your knees. You know, there are things, I shared the story of staying here in, in, in Spokane. There are things that if your wife wants that, fellas, and that's important to her, and it's sound reasoning, think about her. The Bible tells us we should put her first, not second. That's that other religion where they're blowing stuff up. We don't do that. It says to put our wives first. Once you got married, your options changed. All right? Okay. So, what's best for my family? That's a hard question. It's a question that you will wrestle with if you're a single parent. You know, if, if, if that's still a question that you're going to have to answer. But God gives wisdom liberally, the Bible says, to those who ask. Remember, if God tells us not to be stingy, you think he's going to show up? God ain't no hypocrite. He'll give you wisdom. The Word of God, Good counsel and your knees. <laughs> All right? You'll figure it out. And even if you make a mistake and you do those three, God will take you through. You'll be okay. It's going to work out. Remember that scripture we had, Romans 8, 28? All things work together. If you'll do that, it'll work out. All right? Okay. So, can you have hope at work? Well, a few of you can. The rest of you are screwed. Come on. <laughs> can you have hope at work? All right. Uh, would you would you make a promise? I had a rough week last week, and I go, I want to do a reset, okay? Monday. Who's got to be at work on Monday? All right? All right? Okay, if you don't have to be to work on Monday, but you got to be at work on Tuesday. Okay? You guys need a job? Anybody need a job? <laughs> We're hiring. <laughs> okay. All right. When you go through the door at work, let's bring hope this week. Let's pray about it, and then let's show up the most hopeful we can. Let's make a difference in our working place. You know what? You can kick your butt for what you didn't do right, or you can start doing something new. God's mercies are new every morning. So let's start with Monday morning and build on that, okay? Is that cool? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you for your work. And uh, God, I, I got challenged this week like I did last week. But I am so thankful, Lord, that you love us so much that you continue to challenge and bring the best out of us. Lord God, your word is sharp, and it cuts some stuff away. But Father, I've never had you cut something away that didn't need to be cut away. So Lord, if some people are convicted, Lord, let them be convicted. They're not condemned. But God, you realize, Lord, you're bigger than our past. You're bigger than our mistakes. And you promise us a hope and a future. Father God, thank you for giving us honorable work to do. Father God, Whatever it is, thank you for that. Now, everybody, keep your eyes closed, please. Let's bow. All right. So, I want to tell you real quick the greatest work that's ever happened is the work that Jesus did on the cross for you and for me. Jesus did a work that day, and that work was intended for one thing for you to be in a place where you can have a relationship with His Heavenly Father. You've sinned, I've sinned, we've all sinned, but God loves us so much that he gave his son and his son did the work. And, and, and when the work was over, he said, it's finished. And what he meant was, it's done. I've done everything that anyone needs to be in relationship with my father. So tonight, here you are and God's here. If you would like to start a relationship with the God that loves you, with the one that was willing to give his own son so that you could have a hopeful life, a life that is full and meaningful. And I just want to invite you to just simply slip your hand up. That's all you have to do. Slip your hand and say, you know what, that's me. I want to start a relationship with Jesus. Okay. Okay, I see you. Good. Good. I see you. Good. All right. So, church, these people have raised their hands to make a commitment to the Lord Jesus. And what that means is they have a relationship with Jesus, but they've got a relationship with us. We're a family. So I'm going to ask everybody in the house, 
to, to, to repeat this simple prayer with them after me. Okay, you ready? Jesus, please come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Lord, give me the ability to follow you from this day for the rest of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. Okay, if you prayed that prayer, whether you raised your hand or not, if you prayed that prayer for the first time or you're rededicating your life to Jesus, let me just suggest, uh, there's Pastor Dan over there. Pastor Dan, good-looking guy. He's a good-looking man. Yeah. He's over at the 5G table. have a few people. Just, just tell him, hey, I just gave my heart to Jesus, and uh, we'll get a little bit of information. We're not going to bug you, but we want to help you grow in this relationship because great relationships, you know what? You know, they don't just start, they grow. And we'd love to do whatever we can to assist you in growing that relationship. All right, you guys, uh, when do we do church next week? You guys are good. Well, you're excited about that. That's awesome. Yeah. So bring somebody. It's going to be so good. It is good. I know some things are going to happen, but I'm not going to give any more away. I'll see you next Saturday. All right. God bless you.